Uh, I'm a front-end web developer at an ad agency in downtown Dallas. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about WebGL. So has anyone here used WebGL before? Or yes. So um, this is a introduction to WebGL um, for those of you who have never used it before. But if you have, hopefully it'll still pick up a few things too. Uh, so, so what is WebGL? So WebGL is a uh, uh, WebGL or Web Graphics Library is a JavaScript API uh, based on OpenGL ES2, and it's used for generating and rendering interactive real-time 2D and 3D graphics inside of the HTML canvas element inside any compatible web browser without the use of plugins. And it's supported on the latest versions of all the major browsers, as long as your GPU is also compatible. Uh, so what are people actually using WebGL for? So games, of course, like Cube Slam, product viewers and model viewers, like uh, for phones, cars, jewelry, sometimes with customization options, promo sites for uh, TV shows and movies, like Find Your Way to Oz, Gravity, the second Hobbit movie, interactive music videos, like Three Dreams of Black, data visualization, 3D maps, generative art, particle simulations, and those are just a few of the possible uses for this. Um, and most of those were made with the help of 3JS. And 3JS is a 3D JavaScript library um, released in 2010 by Ricardo Cabello, um, also known as Mr. Goop. And I'm gonna jump out of this real quick. I'm on the wrong version of this. Okay. So some of the features in JS include uh, WebGL, um, render, uh, uh, canvas render, SVG render, um, scenes, cameras, geometry, 3D model loaders, lights, materials. And we're going to talk about two of those in a minute. Um, so this is the 3JS website, 3JS.org. And we just looked at a few of these um, featured projects here. Uh, and over on the left, over on the left side, there's um, links to the documentation and resources um, for where you can find 3JS on GitHub, Stack Overflow, Google+, the IRC chat channel. Uh, and the first two links at the top are for um, examples that are included with the 3GS GitHub repo, and even more examples by uh, Lee Stemkowski, a computer graphics professor. And between those two links, uh, there's over 300 examples. And um, your demos will usually be a combination of those features. Um, so we're gonna go through all 300 of those right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding, but uh, there is a getting started page uh, that shows you how to set up a scene with a spinning cube, and this is like the most basic 3JS example, so let's look at the code for this. Uh, this is what the HTML looks like. You uh, just include the main 3JS file, and your JavaScript goes after that. And the JavaScript looks like this. So every 3JS project has at least these a scene, a camera, and a renderer. So you set the size of the renderer and you add the canvas element to the HTML. And then you create a box geometry and a material and add those to a mesh. And then you add the mesh to the scene. And by default, objects are added to the origin coordinates, 0, 0, 0. So um, you have to move the camera out in the z-axis so that it's not inside of the cube. And then to render the scene, you create a render loop using request animation frame. And this will get the render to draw to the canvas 60 times per second. So an easier way to visualize how all these pieces fit together is with this node map here. You can see at the bottom left, the geometry is made up of vertices and three-sided polygons or faces, um, triangles. And you add those, uh, the geometry and the material to a mesh 
and the mesh is a scene graph object along with the camera, lights, and the scene itself. The scene being the root of the scene graph. And scene graph object, or uh, base, object 3D is, yeah, <laughs> object 3D is the, the base class for uh, scene graph objects. Cameras are object 3D, lights are object 3D, meshes are object 3D. Uh, and you can also create a group object which acts as a empty object 3D that you can uh, use as a container for other 3D, uh, <coughs> 3D objects. Uh, and you have to add them to the scene for the, them to show up. And you can add them directly to the scene or you can add them to other scene graph objects. And you can access the children with dot children and the parent with dot parent. And the children will receive all of the transforms of the parent. So there's kind of an extreme example of this in the GitHub repo. Uh, but the, the cube at the center here is the root. And each consecutive cube outside of that is a child of the one right before it. So when you rotate each of the cubes, it rotates all of the children along with it. And the transforms are the position, scale, and the rotation. Uh, and I'm just using tween.js for the transitions here. Uh, and you can see the rotation is in radians. So if you want to rotate something by an exact value, um, you can look at a unit circle, and the values with pi are in radians. Uh, but if you don't want to deal with radians, you can uh, use one of the math utilities to convert degrees to radians. And you can use the unit circle as a reference for other things like animating in a circle. So the x position would be the cosine of the angle and the y position would be the sine of the angle. And you can also use the unit circle as a, uh, as a reference for like, if you uh, divide the, the circumference of a, of a pumpkin by its diameter, you get pumpkin pie. <laughs> Um, sorry, I'm, I'm going on a tangent here. So let's let's talk about cameras. Use <laughs> all. So there's there's two types of, of cameras in 3ds. There's the perspective camera and the orthographic camera. And the parameters for the perspective camera are the field view, aspect ratio, and the near and far clipping planes. And the aspect ratio is the window width divided by the window height. And the field view is the angle between the top and bottom planes of the camera's viewing frustum. So if you increase the field of view, you get a more extreme angle, like a wide angle lens, but you can see that the, the grid is kind of cut off now. So if for some reason your objects aren't showing up, you might need to increase the far clipping plane, because anything outside of the clipping planes won't be rendered. And the orthographic camera doesn't have any vanishing points like the perspective one does. And the parameters for it are just, they just define the, the limits of the viewing frustum. And most of the examples out there also have a window resize event um, that will update the camera's projection matrix so that when you resize the browser window, it doesn't like squish your canvas or stretch it out. So this demo here is just inside of an iframe. So if I resize the iframe, you can see that the camera's viewing frustum is resizing along with it. Now one thing I like to do is add in orbit controls. And orbit controls let you uh, move the camera around the scene. So you can use, if you have a, a three button mouse, you can left mouse to orbit, middle mouse to zoom, and right mouse to pan. <laughs> And this also has keyboard and touch controls too. <coughs> now adding, adding these in is super easy. So you just include the orbit controls file and create an orbit controls object, pass in the camera that you want it to affect, and then update the controls in the render loop. So that's three lines of code. Um, and you can also disable or set limits on certain properties of the orbit controls if you don't want to rotate below the ground plane or zoom inside of an object. And I have a habit of adding orbit controls to everything because it's that easy, but there's also controls 
um, in that same folder for flight and first person controls and Oculus Rift controls, which I'll show you at the end here. Uh, so now let's talk about geometry. There's a lot of different geometric primitives in Vue.js. Uh, and you create them all the same way. Um, you need the three dot box geometry, new sphere geometry, cylinders, torus, and the parameters are for the width or the radius and the resolution or the number of subdivisions along different axes. And that's about it for geometry. So now let's talk about materials. Now there's a few different types of materials in 3 ds um, These are the solid, uh, basic material, Fong, Lambert, and normal materials. So the, sol uh, the, the basic material is just like a solid silhouette color. And the parameters uh, are, the parameter is just a JSON object. And we'll talk about those in a minute. And the Lambert material <coughs> defines a non-shiny matte surface, and the Fong material uh, is for, it, it includes a specular highlight for shiny surfaces. And the normal material uh, uses, it maps the normal vector to RGB colors, and the normal vector um, is uh, a vector that's perpendicular to the surface, and it's used for things like lighting calculations. So if we look at the material properties here, one of them is the shading, and the shading can be either smooth or flat. Um, and the flat shading uses the base normals, and smooth shading uses the vertex normals. And you can also change the color, um, increase the shininess for a sharper highlight, um, turn the wireframe on, uh, make it uh, transparent. And those are just a few of the properties. Um, you can also add texture maps to uh, your model. But first, we need to talk about UVs. So each vertex has a um, XYZ coordinate in wor world space, but it, also, it can also have a UV coordinate in UV texture space. And that just tells the program how to place the image onto the model. It's kind of like a, a soup cam label. So to load a texture, you use the uh, 3JS's load texture image utility. And then you can use that as a value for uh, the map, any of the map properties. And there's a few different types of maps here. This is the color map. The normal map uh, lets you add more detail to a model without adding more geometry by baking the detail <coughs> of the high polygon model into an RGB image that affects the shading normals of a low poly model. And normally, you would create the high poly model in a program like ZBrush, um, where you're sculpting with like millions of polygons, and you would retopologize it in a program like Maya, and then project all the detail into the normal map. And the specular map defines the shape of shiny areas on the surface. So in this case, the water is white and the rest is black. So only the water is shiny. And if I add all of the materials to, or all of the textures to the material, um, it looks kind of like this. It just gives a more realistic look. And your material definition might look something like this. So you'll notice that the, the colors here are a hex value. And passing in the hex value to the color properties will actually create a 3JS color object. And you can change those at runtime with any of the color object methods. You can set or get the hex, RGB, HSL, or a, a CSS style string. And you could also even store different materials and change the material at runtime. So you just do like mesh.material equals another material that you created. So now let's talk about lights. There's a few different types of lights in 3 uh, this is the directional light, and it has a position and a target, but those don't really matter because they're only used to set the direction. <coughs> and the light acts as if it's infinitely far away and all the rays produced from it are parallel. Um, so it's kind of like a sun. And all the lights usually have a color for warm or cool lighting and an intensity 
but I usually don't set the intensity any higher than about one because it tends to blow the light out. And the point light shines light from a specific position in all directions. So it's kind of like the light bulb. And the spotlight um, shines light from a specific position in a specific direction, and it only affects objects um, within a cone defined by the angle and the distance or th and the exponent or the fall off. So it's kind of like a car headlights or a flashlight. And the ambient light uh, applies light to all objects in the scene globally. Uh, so if I set the ambient light to black, it's kind of like the same thing as having no ambient light, uh, but I usually like to have it a little bit darker, or a little bit brighter than pitch black, or a darker shade of the, the material color. Now, one really common lighting technique is three-point lighting. Uh, so you have a, a key light on the left, that's your, your main strongest light, and the rim light on the opposite, sorry, the fill light on the opposite side, which fills in the shadows, and then the the, fill, the, the rim light on the back side that just highlights the contours. And one trick you can use is RGB lighting. So you can set each of your lights to a different color and that will let you see where on the model the, uh, the light is affecting the model. And then you can adjust the lights until you have them where you want them and then dial the color back down. So that's lights. Uh, does anyone here use Sublime text? <coughs> okay, so there's this Sublime autocomplete file in the GitHub repo. So if you don't want to um, remember all the parameters we've been talking about, or um, keep looking back at the documentation, or even the 3JS source, um, you can use this to tap through uh, parameters. So you can just start typing mesh and tab, and then it'll give you all the options for that. And you can tap through each of the parameters. For a better example is the, the sphere geometry. Uh, so if you don't remember like which order it is, like uh, is the the horizontal axis or the vertical axis for the resolution. And uh, so you just you uh, the the file that's in the GitHub repo is out of date. It's for an older version of 3JS. Um, but there's also a Python script in there uh, that you can run that will generate a new Sublime completions file based on uh, the 3JS source. So it'll crawl through the all of the objects and all the parameters in the source and generate the Sublime completions file for you. And then you just copy it to your Sublime Text 2 packages user folder. Uh, it's in a different place on Windows and Mac. I think it might be your library folder on Mac and your app data folder on Windows. Uh, but it's I think it's the Sublime Text packages user folder in both OSs. So in addition to the geometric primitives we talked about earlier, you can also <coughs> put in your own <coughs> models from Maya or Blender or whatever your 3D program of choice is. Uh, and you can load in OBJ files and other uh, 3D model formats, but those usually require an additional loader file. Uh, <coughs> the loader included with 3JS is the JSON loader. So you can convert a OBJ file to a JSON file with a Python script that's included in the GitHub repo. So you just make sure you have Python 2.7 installed, and then you copy that script to the same folder as your OBJ file, and then run the Python script from your terminal with two parameters, the input OBJ file and the output JSON file. And then to load the model into the scene, you create a loader object, and the loader object has a callback function that returns the geometry, and you can just add that to uh, mesh like you would with one of the geometric primitives. And also, if you exported your OBJ file with materials, uh, the converter will include that in the JSON file. So, so the second parameter of the callback is the materials. 
So uh, you can use that as the parameter for the mesh base material. And that will also allow you to add different materials to different bases of the same mesh. And I also want to talk about a few of the other different types of scene graph objects, uh, helpers, lines, sprites, and point clouds. So um, the helpers here, you, use, you can use these for debugging. And we've seen a few of these already in the previous examples. Um, so this is the wireframe helper. And you create it just like any other JJS object, new 3.wireframe helper. And then you pass in the object that you want it to help you with. Um, and then you add it to the scene. So the grid helper, it lets you see where your floor is, what your units are like, uh, what your unit sizes are like, and uh, what your persp perspective distortion is like. And the light helpers are really useful because <coughs> when you add a light to it, uh, you can see where the light is shining, but you might not be able to see where the light actually is. So if you're manually positioning the light with code, it's kind of a guess and check process, but if you add a light helper, um, then you can actually see where your light is. And the axis helper uh, will create lines for each of three axes. The x-axis is red, y-axis is green, z-axis is blue. Um, so you can um, see in this here the, the center of the object is not in the center of the geometry, it's at the bottom. Um, you can change that pivot point in your 3D software before you export your OBJ. So if you were to rotate this model at all, it would the pivot point would be at the bottom. There's also uh, two different types of box helpers. The, uh, the box helper is aligned to the object and the bounding box helper is aligned to the world axis. <coughs> and all of the helpers are actually using uh, the 3-dash line object, and you can create your own lines too. Um, so you just create a, a vertice array and add that to a geometry object, and then you add the geometry and uh, line material to a line object, kind of like you add a geometry and a mesh material to a mesh, you add a geometry and a line material to a line. Now in this example, I wanted to talk about the sprites. So I have these text labels here, and those are sprites. And sprites are a plane in 3D space that uh, is always facing the camera. So they're good for text labels, in case you're like rotating around your scene and you don't want the text to like turn upside down or backwards or something like that. And you create those by just passing in a texture to a sprite material and add it to a sprite object. In the case of the, the large <coughs> thing, did you actually export a little graphic with all the different text labels? And, uh, uh, the text labels here were um, created <coughs> in JavaScript with um, the can it's a 2D okay, canvas. So you're programmatically creating it on canvas and copy it into Yeah, so you can use uh, 2D canvas context for a texture. And so this is a point cloud. Uh, and point clouds are particles or vertices that are all part of a point cloud object. Uh, and it's kind of like the line object, so only you're adding the vertices to, uh, you're creating the vertices <coughs> in a loop, and then adding those to the geometry, and then add the geometry to a point cloud, or a point cloud material. So in this case, you're creating 20,000 point, uh, points or vertices um, all at a random position between negative 1,000 and 1,000. How are you specifying that you're kind of drawing this little square so that you have to scale this kind of Z? Uh, I think by default they're squares, uh, but you can uh, you can pass in a texture map. And 
like each of the points will use that same texture map. Um, I think you might also be able to have different texture maps for different points within the same point cloud. Uh, and the points will um, act like sprites, so they're always facing the camera. Now for, for animation, um, I like to use this library called Tween.js by Soleil on GitHub. And it's kind of like uh, flash motion tween in JavaScript. So to create one of these, you just create two objects with the um, starting <coughs> position or the current position and the end target value. And then you create the tween object with the, <coughs> um, the starting position, the from, and the two objects. And then you just give it the speed or the duration and the easing function, like bounce in, uh, bounce out, easing, uh, ease in, ease out. Uh, and then you uh, assign the tween value to the mesh position or the mesh rotation, whichever property you want, want to tween. And then you add tween update to the render loop. And another technique that I like to use is environment map. And environment mapping takes a uh, panorama and maps it to the inside of the cube. Uh, so if I turn on the wireframe here you can, and zoom out, you can see that this is really just a cube. And this could also be a spherical panorama mapped onto the inside of a sphere. And then you can use it for things like the reflection or refraction in your material properties. And Paul, uh, Paul Lewis actually has a really good article on his website on how you can set up your own, uh, how you can create your own cube maps. He's just using a, uh, an iOS app called Photosynth, um, where you just like move your phone around and it stitches the pictures together for you. And that creates a, a spherical panorama. And then he has a, a Blender file that you can use to convert that to a cube map. And then you just drop those into the folder and give them the same names and it, uh, it just shows up. So one of the last things I want to talk about here is interaction. So in HTML, we kind of take um, mouse events, uh, hover and click events for granted because the browser handles those for us. Um, but what if we want to do this in 3D? So <coughs> 3D is all picking, and we have to set that up ourselves. But 3GS makes it fairly easy. So there's this example in the 3GS GitHub repo called Interactive Cubes. And when you mouse over a cube, it just changes one of the material properties. So mm -hmm. let's look at how this works. So the first step is that you need to normalize the device coordinates meaning the x and y coordinates are between negative 1 and 1. And then you have to unproject the coordinate from 2D screen space into 3D space. And then from that position, you cast a ray in the direction of the camera. And then that will return an array of uh, all the objects that are intersected. And the first object in that array is the one that's closest to the camera. And that's the one that you would select. So the code for this looks kind of like this. You normalize the device coordinates. You unproject into the 3D space, set the ray caster, and get your intersected object. Now I made this little pyramid demo. We're using the ray caster for interaction. <coughs> When you click on the speakers, it'll play a little sound from an audio tag. So the last thing that I want to talk about is virtual reality. Uh, so Mike Let Me Borrow is uh, Oculus Rift. And I was able to get it running in the browser with uh, this program called Oculus Bridge. And Oculus Bridge is, it uses a, a web socket to pass the orientation from the Oculus Rift into the browser. Uh, and then you can use that to set the rotation of 
the, the camera. <coughs> and there's, so there's two things that you need for the Oculus Rift um, demos to work. The, the camera controls, which in this case is coming from Oculus Bridge, and the Oculus Rift effect, which creates your stereoscopic camera rig and your lens distortion. And the one in the GitHub repo actually has um, it has these head-mounted display settings. So um, right now, the it has the DK2 options like hard-coded in there, but the DK1 settings um, are up here. So I had to um, uncomment those and remove the DK2 options since the one I was testing this with is the DK1. And so the, the simplest thing I could think of was to use this with a cube map. Uh, and <coughs> let's see if I can get this right here. For the Oculus Bridge to work, there's two things that you need to do. The, um, you run the Oculus Bridge program, and then include the Oculus Bridge JavaScript file in your HTML, um, which will receive the, the rotation from the WebSocket. Is there, is there much of a depth effect? Um, because it's a cube map? Uh, it's, it feels like it's pretty close up. But that might just be because of the environment. And the, the <coughs> demo that I saw the Oculus Rift bridge in originally was um, the first example that's on the 3JS um, feature project right now. Uh, it's shapespark.com, I think. Uh, and they're using it for architectural or well, interior, interior visualization. Uh, and they actually like layer the Oculus Rift controls on top of first person controls. So we're all worried about the video. Reality in the browser, um, so the V 
VR controls, the VR effect, uh, or device orientation controls, and stereo effect. Um, there's a few few demo <coughs> on this website uh, using Google Cardboard. And then there's also the Web VR API, uh, which is still really new, really experimental. You have to download experimental builds of Firefox and Chrome um, if you want to mess with that. Do you, do you think that will end up making it into the, the spec? Uh, I think that depends on how much people use it. Um, yeah. Question, what does Web VR allow you to do? From what I've read, I think it, uh, it lets you sort of connect your Oculus Rift straight into the browser without running something like That's Oculus Bridge. Bridge. Yeah. Um, so it's like an API that interfaces directly with your Oculus Rift instead of going through that, that middle program. That's what I've read. Don't, don't quote me on that. So, so yeah, um, my, my slides are on my website at davidscottlands.com slash 3JS. Uh, <coughs> right now it's just a shorter version of this presentation. Uh, but uh, if I get my slides for this online later, um, I'll post a link online. Uh, yeah. So earlier you mentioned picking by casting a ray. That makes me wonder, does 3JS present any kind of like ray tracing render by chance? Yeah, it does. Um, there's I think if, if you go to the 3GS website, um, on the left side there's an editor. Um, so it, it kind of gives you a, a GUI for um, for 3JS. So it, you can if you add a light, it'll add a, a light and the helper for you. Um, so it's kind of like it's almost like my 3GS Max in the browser. Um, and there's um, I think it's a drop down list on the right hand side of the editor. Um, it had, lets you change the render, and one of them is a ray tracing render. So you can do ray trace renders in the browser. So how well does that perform? Um, from what I've seen, it's not that bad. Uh, like, there's also uh, a program, or a website called Clara.io, uh, and that's probably the, the most impressive GUI in the browser that I've seen that's running on WebGL. And it actually has a V-Ray render in there, in the browser. So that, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. What about like a physics? Like are there any physics engines that you can tie into? Yeah, uh, I think there's, I tried out one called uh, PhysiJS. It's like physics with the J instead of the C. Uh, it's by Chandler Prawl on GitHub. Uh, and there might be a few other ones like I think Box 2D or AmmoJS. Um, I haven't tried those though. But FizzyJS um, works pretty well. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, um, so in terms of the whole 3D workflow, let's say you make something in 3D Studio Max and it has a material that has an image texture, uh, a color, and a bunch of two separate files. And you bring that, how, how does that whole workflow work in terms of using a converter to turn the OBJ into the JSON format? And follow up question how does OBJS <coughs> handle the asynchronous loading of material images that are in material that then are required to make the mesh work when it's loaded and then finally be added to the scene? Yeah, that's a good question. What was your first question again? Yeah. Um, <laughs> just in terms of getting your textures out of uh, your 3D. Program yeah. in the first place. I mean, how well would this come over out of an OBJ file? Um, it does an OBJ file reference texture. So, so when you export your OBJ file um, with materials, it will um, it will export a, a .mtl file yeah. along with the OBJ, uh, and and then when you go to convert it to a JSON file, it will include the <coughs> from the MTL file in the JSON file along with the geometry data. Okay. Uh, and last time I tried that, the textures weren't showing up, so I was probably doing something wrong. But uh, there's there's some examples in the GitHub repo that have it working. So. Does the UV data come over at least? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the UV data just add the, it back. Right. The, the JSON file has the UV data in it also. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then uh, on, on the loader, does it kind of 
kind of the first thing we detect if there are these dependencies in the image has to go get before it can finish building the geometry. <coughs> uh, so, so like the voter is asynchronous. Uh, so, uh, I've been like, if there's any, uh, if there's any code I'm running that's dependent on the model being loaded, I usually try to put that inside of the callback. Uh, and there's also a loading manager. I haven't really use it that much, but it will. That's it, good for dependencies. Right. It has. Um, if you look at the documentation, uh, there are and there are a few examples using it too. Uh, it kind of like gives you a, a progress of what's been loaded, uh, and there's also a. Uh, I haven't used this either yet, but there's a, a scene loader. Uh, it's an extra file you have to include, but uh, if you're if you're wanting to do like really complex scene. Like loading in dozens of models into one scene. Maybe shaders or something. Yeah. Any other questions? Does it have blob meshes? Blob meshes? Yeah, like blob metaballs, that kind of stuff. Uh, I've seen that before. I don't know how to do those, but I know. Yeah. You can export it from the 3D program however you want to do it. Well, so. So blob mesh is it's more of like a particle effect kind of thing. Maybe. Yeah, I guess that would be uh, something that you would just export. It would be like a, an interactive, like dynamic geometry. Yeah, it'd be like a fluid type thing, like a water fountain or something like that. Yeah, yeah. A lot of that would probably be like um, some like heavy shader stuff. Um, there's uh, shaders are that <coughs> I've been wanting to get into, but. Um, haven't done anything with yet, uh, but you can create a, a shader material for um, material surfaces, uh, or or you can uh, like just do like a, a shader on a sort of like a, a flat surface. Uh, the the shaders are um, they're done with GLSL and create them inside of like a, an X fragment shader, an X vertex shader, or like HTML tag. Uh, and then you can kind of pass those into 3JS. Uh, I don't remember exactly how, but yeah. Is there an orbit control on your screen? Yes, there is. <laughs> Yeah, anything else?